Um, one of the more fascinating quotes I read by you in your recent interview, where you talk about the notion of hatred of something you don't know. You say that it is very easy to hate something that you don't know or don't understand. And in reference to Arab culture, you say if it's kept in kind of a puzzle as a mystery, it is very easy to hate it. There will be hatred and there will be fear. How do you see your role as not only an artist, an incredible artist, but also a cultural ambassador? How do you see your role in demystifying that fear and distilling that mystery? It's uh, uh, going out and introducing culture. Um, you know, I grew up uh, uh, learning about so many cultures mm -hmm. and so many languages. I speak five languages. So uh, uh, it, it gives me so much confidence and I feel serene and <laughs> peaceful. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure that exposing uh, uh, people to, uh, as you know, cultures in general uh, from around the world, uh, uh, languages, musics, uh, it will definitely uh, help uh, uh, mute this fear for, for sure. And, uh, you know, when, when I came to this country, I, there was, Arabic music was, the presentation of Arabic music, or representation, was the nightclub, or what we sure. call the cabaret. Belly dancing. Belly dancing scene, and, which was beautiful, but uh, it is what it is, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, uh, and I met so many musicians who were fantastic musicians, but this was their life, the club. Mm -hmm. And they were afraid to go out and reach out and, uh, you, know, try, you know, do have this adventure, you know, adventurous attitude, if you will. Mm -hmm. So I, the first thing I did was to uh, reach out to performing arts centers and universities, colleges, and I went to schools. I used to wake up at six in the morning and go to schools in New York and in Jersey and Connecticut and uh, introduce Arabic music and culture to the students when they knew nothing about it. Sure. You know? And you feel it that in, in, a, in, a, in a span of, uh, of one hour program, the, the, whole, the whole attitude changes. And you'll see that many students, they come to you at the end and they have this feeling of comfort mm -hmm. so that they can ask questions and open up. So imagine that uh, uh, not only me, but the group that works with me and many other organizations that I have been working with, that we reach out and we do this in larger scale sure. uh, in the United States. Mm -hmm. And this is why, for example, I wanted to have uh, an uh, uh, Arabic art festival in New York, uh, an annual festival. This is why I established the Arabic music retreat at Mount Holyoke College, mm -hmm. where uh, we, every year we have like 100 Americans uh, beside international community and Arab coming to, to study Arabic music intensely. Uh, and this is why I always, whenever I tour, I want to, uh, I would love to <coughs> complement my performances with teaching. Uh, residencies, teaching, visiting hospitals. Uh, I, I started something uh, like going to the, the bedside and perform music. Oh, that's, that's I remember powerful. some people here, they witnessed it when I came, I think 2005 to Ann Arbor uh -huh. for residency. It was like three weeks. And then I, I went to the hospital there and I played for few uh, people who were sick. And one of them was without the heart, he was on the machine. Oh. A very intelligent person. I mean, he was scary, he asked me questions, I didn't know how to answer him. <laughs> yeah, and when I finished uh, the playing and the conversation, I said, man, you have a big heart. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that is powerful. Yeah, so doing all this, uh, reaching out, is definitely is very helpful. Absolutely. So the media has certainly brought it to our forefront of our conscience in, in the recent months and years, um, the whole notion and the movement of Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. it, it has become certainly a topic of many conversations. 
what role do you feel music specifically should or have or has already played in this movement? What do you think the intersection and the connection is? Mm -hmm. It's not only the music, the whole uh, you the, know, the, the, the spectrum of art mm -hmm. is involved uh, and technology is involved and uh, the will. I mean, the most important thing be, be before music and technology and all this, uh, the, the will, uh, the collective consciousness, if you will, uh, of people to uh, ask for uh, freedom, uh, dignity, and regain their government. You know, they want to govern themselves, not uh, being governed by uh, fascism and totalitarian regimes that, uh, you know, I mean, there is the local problem and there is the, uh, the, in, the, the outside problems, Larger you know, that societal. affects the local. So uh, it seems to me that the people in North Africa and the Middle East at large, they, it started, there is no uh, going back to what it used to be. And uh, the media here rushes into, you know, uh, solutions, overnight solutions. Sure. You know, I they mean, stole the idea from we also did American history, you know, the, uh, the 1776, we know what happened here, right? And it wasn't until maybe 100, 120 years later mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, there were the, the slaves, you know, they were freed and the women started to vote. Sure. So it took a span of 100, 120 years. And look at uh, so many revolutions around the world. It took time. So uh, it's like trying to cook something, a nice dish that takes four hours, traditionally speaking, mm -hmm. with technology that will finish it in two minutes. It will never taste the same. It won't be as satisfying and not fulfilling. Not fulfilling. We know that. So I'm sorry to say that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it came to, to my mind, I don't know. I'm crazy about this, these things. So as, as we pay tribute to time and sort of yeah, succumb definitely, to that, definitely. do you feel that music has a way of maybe enhancing, bringing the movement more to the forefront, big time. Big celebrating time. it in big many time. ways? Big time, big uh, time. I did a tour. Uh, the title of the tour was The Call. C-A-L-L, -L, the, the Call. And it was about the Arabic, Arabic the Arab Renaissance. I mean, I hate the word spring. I don't know how the spring came. Idiomatic. It, it doesn't mean language anything to me. But it's Renaissance, yes. Sure. Yeah, it, it, it means something. And uh, we toured, we did like 12 performances around the United States. Sure. And the theme was some new music that I composed mm -hmm. as a reflection on the, the, this, the, the, the movement in the Arab world and a music that was composed in the early 50s up to sure. the early 60s in the Arab world that coincided with the revolutionary movement at that time sure. against colonialism, if you will. Uh -huh. And uh, the greatest musicians in the Arab world like Muhammad Abdul Wahab of Egypt and mm -hmm. Farid Al-Atraj of Syria and the Rahabani brothers and uh, Wadi Al-Safi in uh, Lebanon, uh, they, they, they composed music that integrated with the, uh, the political and social uh, development, uh, development the of, the, of, the, mm -hmm. of the incident there. And uh, music was big, encouraging. It, it gives this oomph to the people to, sure. to go for it. So uh, we, you listen to this repertoire in the 50s, uh -huh. you listen to it today, sure. lyrics and music, as if it was, it, it meant to be performed uh, today, today. So with the Arab relevant. Renaissance. It's very re relevant. It speaks to the Arab mind and consciousness. And we, we selected some of this repertoire and we included it in our tour. Sure. So in many ways, the lessons here are that music reflects societal movements and development and can be relevant during different periods of time because of how relevant it's very it is effective. overall. It's very effective. I mean, uh, there was a president in Egypt called Jamal Abdel Nasser. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in order for him to, uh, uh, to carry on his mission, mm -hmm. you know, uh, after he, uh, he, came, he came in 1952, Sure. And they revolted against the king and the English mandate. 
So in order for him to carry on with his mission, he relied specifically on few artists who supported him sure. and who composed music and performed it uh, in order to instill uh, this uh, fire in the people to, to uh, a source of inspiration, source of inspiration and, and freedom, if you will. Sure. So in many ways, my next question sort of combines the two. Do you feel then that that's where, for you personally, the arts and social justice intersect? And do you feel that we are, from both sides of the question or both sides of the equation, do you feel we're maximizing that connection as a society overall between the arts and music or the arts? Or, or between social justice and the arts? Do you feel we are realizing you know, so, uh, that connection? Yeah, yeah, pointed? of course, of course. I mean, we, we, we are aware of many injustices, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, here, look what you're doing at Sphinx. Huh? How many people couldn't have any opportunity, let's say, 20, 30 years ago? Absolutely. And now with, uh, with your program and organization and opening up and uh, uh, creating those ensembles and conditions, now people, they look up for something. Sure, right? absolutely. When they couldn't play in ensembles and uh, uh, orchestras. And uh, I, I, I'm very much into the underserved, if you will, mm -hmm. right? I, I go and support those communities. Uh, I just, uh, why I took Berkeley to Palestine? This is a society that is underserved. Sure. Why I go to schools here in the even uh, remote places? Because these are underserved communities and we uh, need to connect with them and make sure that music speaks to them. And uh, definitely, if, if, if you, this, the, way, the way you rephrased it uh, uh, was uh, music and social, social justice, justice, definitely, yeah. it, it serves. Absolutely. So to our young people in the audience, what advice do you give them if they feel, despite programs like yours, despite efforts like Sphinx's, what advice do you give them if they encounter instances where the challenges that they face are seemingly too great to overcome, or the stereotypes that they are working to overcome are seemingly too great? What do you say to them? You need to create your own reality, whether you like it or not. I mean, there is no way around it. And those who always can nag and say, you know, the, the, the obstacles are huge are and great. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not that type, and I don't <laughs> encourage this mentality. So you create your own uh, vision, your own reality, mm -hmm. and you go for it. Uh, if there is no a place uh, now, there will be a place in three days from now, or three months from now, or three years it. down the road. Uh, but you create a reality that, is, uh, that has great vision, and it's very systematic, very credible, mm -hmm. and using education is the greatest in instrument I Absolutely. can ask for. That's beautifully said. So among so many of your different collaborations and examples of fusing different genres and cultures and sounds and modalities, one of the beautiful examples that I came across was your album with the great Indian rock master. Vishwam um, Bhatt. I'd love to turn our attention to a short audio ex excerpt from that and just would love to hear your thoughts about how that collaboration came about and mm -hmm. what that meant mm -hmm. to you as yes. an artist. Mm -hmm.
as the oud wanders off, I watch a serene smile on your face. Yeah. Talk about this collaboration. I, I, never, I, I didn't know Vishwa, and it was a, a friend producer uh -huh. uh, in California, Santa Barbara, who called me and he said, listen, uh, in a week from now, this great artist is coming from <laughs> India to perform in California. Do you like to come and re do a recording like with him? And there and you <laughs> <are>. <laughs> Yeah. I said, but, but about what? To do what? <laughs> and he said, just come and uh, let us see how it works. Uh, so I traveled to Santa Barbara uh, on, on, it was Thursday, Friday we recorded. And we met three hours before the recording session. And it was at the missionary. I don't know if you know this church in Santa Barbara. It's known and it has great sound. So I met Vishwa, he doesn't speak English, I don't speak, I don't speak uh, uh, Indian, Hindu. Jaipurian if you will. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we started to talk with the instruments, right? Sure. And uh, trying things here and there, and we recorded, uh, I think, six improvisations. Yeah. Uh, three, me on the oud, and he is on the uh, sliding guitar, yeah. which he had, had a name for it, it's called the, Vish, the, the Mohan, the Mohan Vina. His name is Vishwa Mohan Bhat. Bhat. And the middle name is very important in Indian. Mm -hmm. uh, so he called it the Mohan Vina. So I expected something great, like 2,000 years old. And you don't <laughs> see sliding <laughs> guitar, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the way he played it, it sounded like ancient, and you heard it. So uh, uh, it was difficult to break through his understanding of music. For him uh, to play an improvisation, mm -hmm. a rag, is to play one scale. Mm -hmm. And you cannot uh, deviate from that scale, mm -hmm. even using the same intervals. What I succeeded with him, I said, OK, I'll, I'll accommodate you. I will do whatever you want. and but." you need to uh, do a little modulations here and there. Uh -huh. And you heard it. Actually, yes. this part, there were some modulations. Sounds very and made, Like chromatic <laughs> things that uh -huh. unheard in Indian music, Indian traditional mm -hmm. music. So this was uh, fantastic. And we just started to play. We finished the recording in, uh, in uh, three hours, three and 15 minutes. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this, if it, it happens, it has to happen first time. If it doesn't happen first time, it doesn't work oh, anymore, mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, and uh, then a little mixing here and there, and the, the recording was out. Sure. So in many ways, to me, the lesson here is your unassuming courage to try things that may be unfamiliar and un uncharted. And then the result can be so beautiful. And in some ways, while this is fusing musical traditions, but it is so much larger in many ways. It's fusing cultures. It's telling definitely, a story. Definitely, definitely, no doubt, no doubt. And uh, uh, we have some commonalities and differences, yeah. as you know, in, in the, in the, th so much the like theory, the, the structure of the, um, the, the modes and, and the, the, the style of the playing. Mm -hmm. But we have some common grounds there. And we, we bet, we build on the common grounds. And we expand so from important. there, you know? And you have to take a risk. Yeah. I don't believe in anything without risk. Even when we perform, it's about Taking those beautiful, risks. risky moments. I will have to borrow that, steal it. I, I love That's it. That's great. I love it. So one thing that I know is a common thought and sometimes a challenge, especially among young people um, that are looking to draw upon their respective cultural heritage and really drawing that and connecting it to their art. I think sometimes the challenge arises where if it's a person of color or if it's a person that comes from an underrepresented background, as they try to fit in, it is so important to meet these benchmarks, so to speak, and make it in the traditional world. What advice do you give to our young artists on the value of that balance of connecting their cultural heritage to their art, but then still fitting in and sort of earning their 
their place in, in a traditional sense. This is why I think Berkeley is, is great. <laughs> because musicians, they come there, they bring uh, their own whatever, their own heritage and tradition. Mm -hmm. But uh, of, of course, they, they, uh, they are adventurous. And Berkeley offers, of course, this very solid program. Yeah. But then it allows you this uh, flexibility as well. Uh, mm -hmm. as well. Not allowing you in the sense that, okay, I'll give you a little bit of flexibility and that's it, stop mm -hmm. there. No, it's, you can do whatever you want. Uh, and uh, uh, the, this is the beauty of bringing something from your own heritage mm -hmm. and integrate it with whatever uh, dreams you have, sure. musical dreams. And this why it becomes special. Otherwise, okay, I go to Manhattan School of Music and I play Bach and Brahms, then what? But now when I play on the violin and uh, you hear uh, Bach and Brahms and Isai and uh, Muhammad Abdul Wahab and Nishdat uh, uh, Yashar and you know all these, and Simon Shaheen. Oh, I know that Right? <laughs> because I have to bring myself to the table. Sure. To the, to the plate. <laughs> So uh, this is, uh, for me, this is glorious. This is fantastic. I love it. Sure. So and you find provide, that. provided that it is really, uh, there is depth and this organic marriage or integration, yeah. if you will, of all these uh, components. Absolutely. Sure. This has got to be one of the more difficult questions to ask you, but as an artist, can you think about and share one of the more poignant memories that you have of being on stage? Being on the stage? As an artist performing. If you had to pick one of several. Um, there are so many, I don't know where to start. I mean, you look at this picture, right? Sure. Uh, those were uh, a uh, uh, jazz group at uh, Kimmel Center in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And uh, we integrate with the jazz group, uh, the, with, the, with the program at the Kimmel uh -huh. Center, we involved the uh, school system sure. of Philadelphia with it. And there were so many uh, musicians of color and uh, different, ethnic different backgrounds. ethnicities, yes, yeah. there. Uh, so. Uh, I was supposed to perform at the Kimmel Center at mm -hmm. the end of the residency, and I decided that I want to have like 10 or 12 in the group to come on the stage and perform for me like for half an hour. Which is so great. And I ended up me performing with them, not them performing with me. So that, that stands <laughs> it, it out. It was fabulous. It was uh, striking. Another example, I, was, uh, I went to Syria three mm -hmm. years ago. This was exactly two months before the, the war started. Mm -hmm. And uh, I uh, was supposed to perform with the Syrian Symphony, National Symphony Orchestra, mm -hmm. uh, the old concerto that I wrote for the Detroit Symphony. Sure, basically. that we get to hear. Right. And then uh, uh, during my visit, I visited a few camps, especially the Armu camp in mm -hmm. uh, Damascus. And I work with young children, boys and girls. Mm -hmm. And they play, you know, uh, uh, the Arabic traditional instruments, sure. including the oud, the kanun, the zither, the nai, percussions, and many others. Uh, then uh, an idea came to my mind that they should come and play with me on the stage. And uh, when, I, when I suggested the idea, there was a certain <laughs> resentment to it by the officials, but then, you know, it worked out. It sure. worked out. And, you know, I invited them, they came and played with me on the stage. Uh, and this was a mesmerizing experience. We performed maybe for another half an hour or 40 minutes. Sure. And this for them, it was a great moment. Of course. Because they were on the stage of the Opera House and they felt that uh, they, it was like stepping to the next, to the next stage, to the next level. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, it was eye-opening for them, and they felt great. So uh, those beautiful. those are uh, those are some of the things memories that, stand that out. can can I can never forget. That's that's wonderful to hear. So completely switching topics. Wellness has become a theme, what at that? least in the last when? wellness, health and wellness has become a theme in, in many conversations now among artists. So taking care of oneself, many artists do yoga, other things, and, and really are beginning to think about what they eat, etc. I think I'm hearing that you're a vegetarian. Yes, correct. Why did you choose that? Why that choice? And what effect do you think it has on you? I didn't today? choose. I was born vegetarian. You were born vegetarian. Yeah, <laughs> like, like, like elephants. And <laughs> and goats. <laughs> Is there a health-driven reason or a spiritual reason for choosing that way? No, not I. I, I I'm not aware of it. But uh, I, uh, you know, my my parents tried to feed me a little bit of meat. Mm -hmm. we, we we are not uh, uh, meat eaters. Sure. Or eat meaters, but. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, you know, we use little meat with vegetables and... Sure. But they try to feed me and I always found a way to get rid of it. Creative. So I, I never liked meat and the taste of it. Chicken, no, never. Gotcha. So, uh, yeah, this is how uh, I, I, I like it this way. And it's, uh, it reflects on my health, of course. Sure. Uh, it feels great. Uh, infinite uh, amount of energy. I never, I'm never You're tired. You're never tired. No, no, no. We're going to go vegetarian. Yeah, go vegetarian. But then uh, you have to eat the right combinations of vegetables and mm -hmm. beans. And yeah, you Are cannot just you say, hate? you know, yeah, you can't just say I'm vegetarian. And you know, in our kit, uh, uh, you know, in our diet, the Mediterranean, the sure. Arabic diet, we have zillions of vegetarian dishes. So of we course. don't have problems there. Sure. And you know, Americans now they start to talk about the Mediterranean yeah, uh, diet. Yeah, it's a topic. Right? Mm -hmm. It's a topic. Yeah. <laughs> but it's true, it's not only a topic. Sure. Uh, the other thing, I do a lot of uh, you know, uh, daily stretching. Uh -huh. And I have been doing this what, 40, 45 years. Forever. And uh, therefore, uh, it's all, always feel, it feels good. I never had joints Any problems, joint problems and muscles problems and ach and uch and no, no, never. So, There's your wellness advice. Yeah, so it, it's great. I'll try that. That's, that's, that's great. And you have to love what you do. That reflects on your well-being, of Definitely. course. What about any other passions in life? You are such a consummate artist, musician, pedagogue. What are other things that, that move you? What are, what are you passionate about besides that? I think we cover much of it. But uh, passion... Uh, Play, playing tennis is a big, big thing for me. And you don't have any tendonitis? No, 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 no. Okay. no. Yeah, you, you need to know how to use it. And uh, I do canoeing. You canoe, wow. Yeah, yeah, this is a great thing. This is why I, I bought a house next to the Delaware in the, in the Pennsylvania, uh, New Jersey borders there. Sure. So I, whenever I have the chance, I go there. I, and I do canoeing, and in the summer, you know, I spend maybe a week every day canoeing, canoeing. That's, that sounds amazing. It's so fantastic. So, you sit here today, a recipient of the National Heritage Award from National Endowment for the Arts, an 11-time Grammy nominee, a recipient of so many awards, way too many to mention, an eminent composer, scholar, social entrepreneur, cultural ambassador, an incredible artist. And because you're here with us tonight for embodying the very ideals that we remember Dr. Arthur Johnson for, which is that very intersection of arts and social justice, I thought it would be fitting if we play a short clip of a question that Sphinx's founder and president, Aaron Dworkin, asked of Dr. Johnson late in his life. Mm -hmm. And that question was, what is the single most important factor that had enabled him to lead the life that he led? And Dr. Johnson answered, Never be satisfied with simply doing what is required. Do more than what is required. The path to greatness is a path made in, in, by those 
who were willing to do more than what is required. So with that poignant answer about doing more than what's what required, required, which yeah. is just so profound, Alustaf Simon, as you sit here today, what would you say is the most single most important factor that had enabled you to lead the incredible and rich life that you've been leading? Uh, uh, those two words are uh, heavenly. I mean, there is nothing They're beyond magical. them. I mean, you couldn't say anything beyond that. So uh, do more than what required is, is, is the essence of, uh, uh, of any vision. And uh, I, I, I love it. This is the path. It's incredible. It's one of the more powerful quotes that, that I've ever heard. It's been tremendous to have you here. I would love to give the, the audience a chance to ask you some questions, but I'm going to ask Jen White, our dear hostess, to come out and facilitate a short discussion. Mm -hmm. So we have time for just a couple of questions. Are there any questions in the audience? Put your hand up, there you go. No. <laughs> oh yes, there will be, I guarantee it. Uh, hi, I was wondering um, over here, well, yes. Yeah. There we go. Uh, I was wondering, as a teacher, especially at a school like Berkeley, uh, if you have much experience with teaching improvisation. Um, improvisation. Yeah, and uh, as in particular to people who uh, don't have a lot of experience with improvisation, and what your experience has been with that. Yeah, th this is what I teach there. I mean, improvisation. <laughs> And uh, improvisation in uh, the different genres, I mean, including the traditional Arabic, uh, Indian style, American, in jazz, American jazz, and sometimes uh, cross lines, you know, integrating uh, elements from different uh, uh, improvisational schools to, together. <coughs> Only a few days ago, I was working with a student of mine uh, on a piece called Cheek to Cheek that Grappelli arranged for violin. And I said, okay, let's do the improvisation that Grappelli did. So she worked it out very well. Nice, transcribed the whole improvisation. And then he said, okay, let's now add our characters into the <laughs> improvisation. And we started to, uh, to incorporate uh, different vocabulary into the, uh, into what Grappelli did. Mm -hmm. And you know, it became a fantastic piece. It's, it's, uh, it's creating something on creation that, sure. that, that is there. So uh, yeah, we, we worked a great deal uh, on improvisation. And uh, I teach also uh, a, a class, it's called Microtonality uh, uh, Theory and Practice. And we discuss uh, microtonality in different cultures, but we always uh, rely on a culture that has been practicing microtonality for thousands of years. We cannot start with microtonality as it's practiced in New York 20th century. It means nothing to me. But you start, you depart from that culture, and then you introduce microtonality as is used in uh, uh, Spanish flamenco or Irish music, uh, Eastern European music, in uh, Japanese traditional music, folk music. Uh, and then people start to realize that there's microtonality all over the world. But the most important aspect in, uh, uh, in, in introducing uh, the, the art of micro, you know, the microtonality as a system is the art of improvisation. And this is a great musical source, if you will. We have time for one more question. Yes, good evening. Um, I guess the question that I want to ask is uh, about the oral tradition. I'm sure that when you were growing up, your father and passed on sort of oral tradition to play the oud, uh, just sort of passed it on generations of music to you, and how much of oral tradition do you bring on to your students and require them to do stuff by ear as opposed to really just reading music all the time? And do you encourage oral tradition, learning music by ear, and the, uh, performing the, that way as well? This is a humongous question. It's a really great question, I mean, because our music is about, you know, 
it's oral music. Mm -hmm. And uh, at Berkeley, Berkeley Cantara, the ensemble that you saw Sigmund playing, uh, out of seven or eight pieces that we work on every uh, each semester, two selections has to be done orally, meaning that whether you like it or not, you have to listen, and we will, I will sing, and you repeat after me, and you play it. And we work on arrangement as we learn the piece of music itself. This is one thing. The second thing about, uh, I always uh, uh, show uh, musicians their violinists or cello players or, uh, you know, brass, whatever. I, I show them how uh, to embellish the, the music that they play. Uh, and then I take something and I play it for them as they heard it. And then I add to it embellishment. And suddenly, you know, it, it, uh, it, 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 it lit the light, you know, in, in their mind. So uh, we, we incorporate the art of embellishment. I always tell them about how a, a single piece of music or maybe a page of written music that if you would take it to Egypt or Syria or Turkey and you give it to four violinists and you ask them to play it, each violinist will play it differently, but together they sound uh, heavenly. So, uh, uh, and they all play with ornaments. So they incorporate the ornamentation as they play the, the music. And we work on that. And it's done orally, but uh, I always, uh, like to uh, document things, you know what I mean? Uh, document things not only because uh, people, some people think that documentation is an enemy of orally transmitted, uh, you know, sounds or music, mm -hmm. and it's not true. Uh, you can just create uh, document enough to. Uh, to, uh, to uh, protect it and, sure, and, to preserve. and, and preserve it uh, to coming generations. And uh, since we have a lot, you know, the, 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 the luxury of the recording industry now and recording whatever, uh, it, it helps a lot. Wonderful. Well, with that short opportunity to talk with you, I'd like to ask Sphinx's founder and president Aaron Dworkin to come and join us on stage for a few remarks. Hi, Aaron. Good evening, everyone, and thank you again so much for sharing your art, your music, your life, and your passions with us. This was just truly an amazing experience, and I know I speak on behalf of everyone when I just say, Thank you, and thank you, Afa, for helping to bring Simone's story to life. Thank it you both so much. <laughs> As we kind of embark on this journey every year of Sphinx Khan and carrying conversations and issues relating to uh, diversity and the arts, all the while the competition is going on and some of our young uh, people who are in the process of competing and have rehearsals tomorrow and competitions yesterday, I just wanted to share that experiences like this are just in incredibly uh, humbling and when I think about just myself as a violinist um, and I think about uh, being a part of the team that's trying to do this work related to diversity, that the only way it's possible to carry any of these issues that we're working on forward, whether as individuals or as artists or as, as social entrepreneurs, um, it's through coming together and it's through collaborating and it's through hearing and being inspired by what others are doing. And I was just so incredibly inspired uh, by your entire life's work. It is truly incredible. Thanks. So thank you very, very much. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you a friend and a colleague of mine and a friend to Sphinx and to all of the issues that we work on, 
both here locally, regionally, as well as nationally. She's a past president of the Access Board of Directors, a member of the University Musical Society Senate, a co-founder of the Bustan al Funun Foundation for Arab Arts in America, and a founding member of Zaituna, an Ann Arbor-based group of Jewish and Palestinian women working for peace and justice. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Wadad Abed. I have to bring this down. Uh, thank you very much, Aaron. And this has been an incredible evening for me, but also to be on stage with the likes of Simone Shaheen and Aaron and, and Afa is, is humbling because I just don't see myself as equal to that. But um, I have to congratulate the Sphinx organization for their choice of Simone Shaheen because you embody what your mission is all about, and that is to transform lives through diversity in the arts. And if there is one word to describe Simon Shaheen, in my view, is that he is a transformative artist. He's transmor transformative um, in the music itself, but also for the audiences. And I think of you um, as we were working on trying to get with the musical society, try and get Arab audiences. As you know very well, Arab audiences are, are entranced by vocals. They, they want to hear lyrics and, and songs. And Simone Shaheen has helped us appreciate just music. Listen, sit back and listen to the music. And I think that has elevated the Arab audiences as well. So, um, as you listen to Simon Shaheen, and you'll be fortunate on Sunday to listen to his uh, Oud concerto, right? The question comes to mind usually of people who listen to his compositions is, is it jazz? Is it Western classical? Is it Eastern classical? Is it Latin? And I would say it's Simon Shaheen <laughs> because he transcends all these labels and defy, defies all these labels and transcends all divisions and differences. So it is my honor and personal pleasure to present Simon Shaheen on behalf of the Sphinx organization with the Arthur L. Johnson Memorial Award. <laughs> And I'm also, supposed, I'm also supposed to congratulate him in Arabic, so I'm going to do it in colloquial Palestinian Arabic. Mabruk Simon, The second one was a Palestinian kiss. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's, it's my honor to be standing here in front of you and to accept this uh, award. It means uh, the, the, the world for me. And I, I want to announce that uh, I would like to encourage some of your students to come to the retreat, the Arabic music retreat in the summer. And uh, uh, we, I, I, we would like to offer at least two scholarships for students who would like to join the Arabic music retreat. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you, Simone, Afa, Wadad. Thank all of you. Thank all of you, and we will see you tomorrow morning for our sessions. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>